In theory, accessing reality's base layer could yield a multifunctional, self-energized computational system, outperforming modern supercomputers. From such a perspective, the key to harnessing the tremendous computational power of a microcomputer embedded in a nature to control matter in unconventional way and reprogram its properties lies in our ability to make it compute not just its own self, but also other tasks of similar complexity that are of interest to us. This approach is recognized in modern computer science as the concept of metaphoric computing. Complex systems such as weather, plasma, and the economy have highly complex and chaotic behaviors, making them difficult to study. They involve a large number of data points in multiple dimensions, overwhelming even advanced supercomputers. On the opposite side of the same coin, we can regard the physical system as a computational device that computes its own dynamics at a speed unimaginable by supercomputers. Conventional computers, despite being physical systems, use complex semiconductor physics for basic logic operations and discards a large amount of information that is considered extraneous. In this perspective, a digital computer is an extremely inefficient computing device, as it only utilizes an exceedingly small amount of the full computing capability. To leverage the full computing power of physical systems, researchers proposed metaphoric computing. This concept uses accessible physical systems to simulate others, like how wind tunnels model large-scale fluid dynamics. Metaphoric computing isn't limited to similar systems, but extends to various methods, including simulating quantum systems with a quantum computer. So, unconventional computers are not just feasible. We have initial theoretical physics research supporting the use of the computational power inherent in matter. If this hypothesis is valid, the precision found in the artifact might represent the minimal outcome achievable by such computational technology. Like software's adaptability, the vase's creation could be a mere glimpse of the potential applications. How can we use such a microcomputer in nature to utilize its power and bridge the physical universe with the mental realm? Carlo Rovelli, theoretical physicist and writer, reminds in his paper that there's a notable gap in our understanding between the physical universe and abstract concepts like meaning and intentionality. These abstract notions, crucial for understanding life and human behavior, are not present in basic physics posing a challenge for the question of interaction of the body and the psyche. But the concept of information can be a tool to bridge this gap. Specifically, the ideas inspired by a model from David Wolpert and Artemy Kolchinsky demonstrates that combining two physical concepts can create meaningful information, a concept typically considered non-physical. He clarifies that while meaningful information isn't the entirety of human intentionality and purpose, it forms a foundational layer upon which these complex concepts can be developed to restore the bridge from physics to mental. And human intentionality in this process is what Professor William Tiller suggests might be the key to activate this bridge. Tiller revisits Dirac's fundamental idea that the physical vacuum, or the other unseen domain, so to speak, is filled with negative energy states, meaning it's brimming with an unknown stuff, not emptiness. For more insights into Dirac's perspectives on the dual structure of the universe and the other side of reality, please refer to this episode. Imagine this a realm of negative energy states representing the other side of reality is divided from the positive energy states of our known reality by a no-go zone. The energy within the physical vacuum is colossal. The energy in the space of just one hydrogen atom vastly exceeds the mass energy of all known cosmic matter in our observable universe. Dirac's idea was that if you hit the sea of invisible energy with a strong enough burst of light, an electromagnetic photon, you could knock an electron into the world we can see materializing it. 
When the electron gets pushed out, it leaves behind a hole in this invisible energy sea. This hole behaves like the opposite of the electron, which we call antimatter. Thus, Dirac proposed that we live in a sea of virtual, unobservable via our present-day instrumentation, stuff, particles or waves, the Dirac Sea. Such photon interaction with such a sea of invisible energy proposed by Dirac can have biological analog, because the human body emits biological photons or biophotons. Dr. Ernesto Bonilla in his paper suggests that the emission of light particles, biophotons, seems to be the mechanism through which an intention produces its effects. He defines intention as a directed thought to perform a determined action, capable of influencing both inanimate objects and all forms of life. Bonilla notes that all living organisms emit a constant current of photons for instant communication within the body and externally. He explains that direct intention manifests itself as an electric and magnetic energy producing an ordered flux of photons, operating as orderly and synchronized energy waves that can change matter's molecular structure. It's like comparing the diffuse light of a lamp to the focused beam of a laser. For an intention to be effective, Vanilla emphasizes the importance of timing. He notes that living beings are in sync with each other and with the Earth, along with its magnetic energy fluctuations. He also points out that the energy of thought can also alter the environment, highlighting the interconnectedness of living beings and their surroundings. It was Professor William Tiller who showed such alterations are possible in his experiments. Tiller points out that the vacuum structure suggested by Dirac is similar to the energy bands found in basic semiconductors, suggesting that from a material science perspective, the quantum vacuum can be thought of as having a structure like that of a perfect crystal. This isn't just a poetic comparison. It has practical applications. For instance, such physics could underpin phenomena like object levitation. In our research context, ancient artisans might not have needed modern-like precision bearings. With access to such physics, they could have used magnetic fields to suspend objects in mid-air, enabling a quantum lock or free rotation during modeling, thus achieving a highly balanced and symmetrical end product. There is a growing body of experimental data and evidence that supports the idea that intention can exert a tangible influence over physical systems. In the notable study of Tiller and Dibble, they observed changes in environmental properties like temperature and pH in laboratory settings where intention-imbued instruments were used. These changes seemed to indicate a shift in physical reality within the lab potentially due to ordering effects exerted on virtual particles in an unseen domain. Virtual particles don't exist in the same way as ordinary particles. Yet they are crucial because the micro world is interconnected with the macro world. In these situations, it seems like virtual particles just materialize from nowhere or help other particles to disappear. When scientists study the tiny world of quantum, they consider not only the basic particles and the quantum field, but also the vacuum around them, which is filled with these virtual particles. Essentially, scientists agree that virtual particles are real, but they exist in a very special and different way. We can safely speculate that repeated intention can alter physical reality potentially by ordering quantum virtual particles in space. This ordering effect suggests a sort of charging of the space with intention. Tiller experimentally found and proved another interesting effect, that when intent is repeated in the same space, eventually it becomes permanent. And when that happens, the laws of physics in that particular space no longer operate as they did before. When they kept running the same experiment over and over again, Tiller says the laboratory space began to become conditioned so that the same result would happen more strongly or more quickly. Now, in physical terms, what does this mean? What has actually happened to the space of the laboratory room? 
Tiller notes that their experiments suggest an increase in the room's physics gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetry is the theory used by physicists to explain how the fundamental laws of physics remain consistent across various conditions. It shows that these laws stay the same, even when certain properties of a system are altered. However, in their experiment they observed significant changes versus those received in a quoted normal space. It is something different than energy and it's something different than vibrations, but it is something very complex which we call the electromagnetic gauge symmetry state. It's an aspect of symmetry in nature, but quite different than like snowflakes. So this one is, is another symmetry state, but it, it is on a macroscopic level. In terms of our normal reality, from that level of reality, it isn't really po possible to intend to make things happen. You don't, you don't get much if, if the room stays at that state. But if you can lift that room state to a higher, the next higher gauge symmetry state, then you can intend things to happen with respect to a material or with respect to the room, and they do happen. And w with our tools, we have been able to measure the departure from our normal thermodynamics of the room. Okay, our, our normal state, we have a well-developed thermodynamics, very precise, um, and we have measurement tools, like a pH meter, measuring alkaline mm -hmm. acid, acidity of a solution. We can theoretically calculate what the pH electrode should be like, okay, in that kind of room. And we can see the mathematics that begins to say, hey, it's departing from normal reality. And the, the piece of information that relates here is that what we do, the experimental evidence of a space at this higher symmetry state, it manifests magnetic property influences which look like we're accessing magnetic monopoles. Now, it turns out in the late in the 1960s and early 1970s, really great physicists with huge devices and lots of government money around the world were looking for magnetic monopoles because physicists thought symmetry, you got an electric monopole, that's the electron, there should be magnetic monopoles. And none of them found magnetic monopoles. But all of them were making their measurements from the U1 gauge state. When we lift the gauge symmetry state to the next level, we see evidence that says, hey, that looks just like the behavior you'd expect from a magnetic monopole. So what does that mean to us, at least on an everyday life, raising our state into that? What can happen there? What can we do there? Anything. Anything. I mean, you, you, can, you can use your intention to change the properties of materials. Tiller's experimental results illustrate the creation of special conditions under which we gain access to the physics of the other side and show that intention can create regions of organized structures in a quantum vacuum. In his paper, Tiller suggests that there might also be other factors at play. One of these factors involves something from a different level of reality, which he calls the emotion domain. Hence, he proposed expanding the previous reality structure to include the higher dimensional domains of emotion and mind that then makes it possible for humans to access the almost magical physics of the hidden side. We can suppose that in this emotion domain, there are things that can jump up and fill the gaps where antimatter would be. By doing this, they get rid of some antimatter and materialize more matter in our space. The interaction between the observable and non-observable realms is said to potentially conflict with relativity theory. Hence, the author suggests there's something else beyond space and time. These hypothetical entities from deeper levels of the vacuum, the emotion domain, are suggested to act as couplers between observable and hidden phenomena. That echoes the experiments by Jack Hauck on psychokinesis, where he noted that for such phenomena to occur, one should create peak emotional states. He found experimentally that such effects work in close connection with speech and the power of the word. Hauck also talks about the necessity of some kind of computational system in nature to support such phenomena, which ties back to our earlier conversation about the possibility of, in quotes, 
microcomputers being integrated right into physical matter itself. It's intriguing that the hieroglyphic representation of the Egyptian term for magic includes the symbol for the word ka, underlining its tight connection to biology, to man and his double. In short, the concept of a double refers to an exact replica of a person made of a substance less dense than the human body. Additionally, it represents a vital force believed to differentiate the living from the inanimate. The pyramid texts from the Old Kingdom personify magic as a depiction of Heka, portraying it as a type of conscious energy possessed by the gods. The conscious force, as portrayed in Egyptian literature, was present before duality had yet come into being, suggesting an elemental aspect in the universe's framework akin to what we might now perceive as a part of a fundamental structure of the world. Heka magic is many things, but above all, it has a close association with speech and the power of the word. Some of these ancient ideas have interesting intersections with modern day's experimental results, and they can hardly be written off as pure fantasies. Overall, it seems like we don't really understand what quantum vacuum is all about, and there is so much more to its physics that we will discover in the future. It's almost like we're still cavemen in terms of using its possibilities. But at this point, it looks as if all the higher dimensions function in the physical vacuum and are they're different kinds of stuff, but they're all sort of wave-like stuff. But very likely, there will be something dramatically different and it will be time for a course correction. So you think of it as a trajectory of our evolution. There was the theocratic one, then there was a the distance time one, now there'll be a psychoenergetic science one, and then something else beyond that. I mean, that's what we have to be awake and open to, not let ourselves fall into hubris. Now, returning to the technical aspects of the ancient artifact, it's worth recalling that precision in our technologically advanced civilization is both time-consuming and costly, and is pursued for specific purposes or tasks. Even modern vessels manufactured on lathes exhibit not just inferior parameters, they are finished better on the outside than on the inside. This is because precision does not affect the vessel's function. Meticulous craftsmanship enhances aesthetics, and it's this logic that prevails in contemporary products. In contrast, ancient stone vessels were deliberately crafted with precision in the thickness of their walls and coaxial alignment. According to a keen observation by Mark Kvist, by their parameters, they resemble mathematical maps more than they do vases. This leads us to question not only the unidentified technology and origin of these objects, but also their true intended purpose. Apart from the language of mathematical constants, they bear no marks, hieroglyphs, or decoration. It is true that these objects are stylized as vases or containers and can be used as such, but was that their intended original purpose? A genie remains in the bottle, and a question remains unanswered for the time being. <laughs>